Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for getting ahead as a student, but a terrible resource for learning how to genetically engineer your skin so that it glows with neon colors in the dark. Bad resource for that. Could you do that with like a tattoo? Can you do? You can could you probably get, like. Can you get a glow in the dark tattoo? Is that a real thing? Maybe with some crisper crispering. Well, like, couldn't I just? Take, I don't know. Couldn't I just take the bacteria from an angler fish's thing light thing and like inject it into my skin yes <laughs> and if you uh, go to a tattoo parlor yeah i give them this angler vial. fish i got no i got it in a vial i'm i'm civilized i i did all the gross stuff behind doors but i like the idea of you bringing the angler fish into the tattoo parlor just in a plastic bag yeah kind of like in finding nemo try not to hurt him this is frank but he's agreed okay. to loan me his bacteria yeah, just a little bit, and I'm going to get a cool try to, tattoo. Try to get some of that. Mom. I'm sure that injecting strange bacteria into my skin is fine. Make it look cool. It is fine. It is fine. All right, let's get into this episode. A uh, real quick note, we are on episode 296 of this show. So for people who have not been listening to the past uh, probably 10 or so episodes, uh, after episode 300, we are changing the name of this show. So it's going to appear as a new name in your feed, which I just thought of something. Maybe we should keep our faces in the artwork. Oh, that would make it less confusing. What is this show? That's very possible. (laughs) Yes. Um, But yeah, so no no other changes other than there there won't Mm. be a student-focused name of the show anymore, which won't pressure us to make student-focused content. Um, Yeah, we'll go episode one. We've done for like 100 episodes. We're going to episode one of a new thing. That yeah. way we don't run out of numbers. I'm pretty sure that there aren't that many numbers after 300. There aren't. And I didn't there want to are. run into the, the upper limit. Yeah. You don't want to run into the upper limit of numbers. Well, this isn't a math podcast. It's, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. Yeah. So one thing that we are going to continue to do in our new show is read and review or discuss books. Um, and this is a book discussion episode, even though it's not the new name of the show. But this week we are discussing the book Hyperfocus by Chris Bailey, who is actually a friend of mine. He's been on this show a couple of different times. Uh, both were before episode 100, I want to say. And they are some of my favorite episodes. I think the first one is called The Best Thing You Can Do for Your Productivity. And then the second one is called The Worst Thing You Can Do for Your Productivity. Oh, uh, yeah. So... Chris has been on this show. Um, I believe at least the second time he was on the show, his first book, The Productivity Project, had been released. I read that book. I found it very helpful and enlightening. And he has a new one called Hyperfocus, which is a bit more, well, pardon the pun here, but a bit more focused on the science of focus, the science of keeping distractions from tearing your attention away from the things that you intend to do, or rather that's actually what half the book is about. And that was actually kind of an interesting revelation as I was reading is half the book is actually about not focusing and doing that in a deliberate way that has uh, a lot of useful benefits. So both Martin and I read the book. um, And this book was for me, the start of my note taking habit, getting back into full swing. So I actually took very detailed notes on this book, which I have posted on my personal website and they're under the book notes section. So if you want to see like everything I took in in terms of notes for this book, you can see it there. Um, And then in the show notes, I'll probably link up those notes along with a link to buy and read the book if you want or listen to it because it's also an audible. That is true. I read it though. And actually let me, let me start things off there because I have sort of come to a conclusion. Okay, uh, if I want to take conclusion? Notes, if I want to take notes on a book, I'm probably not going to listen to it. Oh, that's, With that's one like potential exception. Why I don't listen to most books. I have one potential exception there. Um, with one book, it's called Hitmakers. I'm listening to it, and then I'm going to go back and read it again after I listen to it and do my note taking that way. And I want to see if that kind of helps in um, recollection and everything. I don't think huh. I would ever read a book twice, like in a row, 
without a lot of time passing. But uh, since I go skating every day and I don't always go skating or I don't always go bike riding with you or Tony, sometimes I go by myself, uh, I want to listen to something. So I've been listening to Hitmakers and I think it might be an interesting little experiment to try going back through it and seeing if that's helpful. One or two things will happen. Either I'll read it again and find it very helpful or I will be too bored to read it again because I've already gone through it. I guess we'll find out. We are going to find I out. I've not done that particular on, arrangement of things before. On the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. I wish. <laughs> That's the new names of the podcast. Is Dragon actually. Ball Super still gone? I don't know. I digress. Uh, I don't know. I imagine that all things in terms of anime just go on forever. Or at least in terms of shonen anime. It's and not you know, that like hard. Battle anime just, just goes on forever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one thing uh, I'm looking at my notes here before we get into the book, I do want to make a possible correction. So, uh, in the episode we did on five skills, I mentioned that I figured that rollerblading would be less hard on the knees than running. And I got an email from a listener who says, uh, let's see here. I'm a, th- I'm a, th- a physical therapist and I deal with the misconception that running is bad for your knees on a daily basis, and I couldn't let this pass. The impact you receive while running is actually quite good for the cartilage in your knees, ankle, hip, and spine. Because cartilage has poor vascularization and gets its uh, nutritional substances from decompression and uh, compressing of the structure, so I guess running is good for that. Uh, as a quickness, as a quick side note, you need to build up your mileage gradually in order to prevent running-related injuries, and he re- linked it to a study confirming what he said this guy from belgium i looked at the study and it was interesting to see that uh people who it looked at people who were sedentary people who ran as amateurs and people who ran professionally and they found more cartilage degradation in the sedentary group and the professional runner group than in the amateur running group oh interesting Um, what i would be interested to know is can that study and its results given the sample size and given the groups of people tested can that be um, contrasted or compared to people who do different forms of exercise like rollerblading. I didn't see any kind of comparison to people who are, you know, doing biking or rollerblading. It was a sedentary group. So, yeah, but the concept that running by itself is going to crush all your cartilage out of existence. Yes. Is in fact not true. Although it seems it maybe would be true if you overdid it. And that's interesting too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not at risk. Of all that science it being put aside personally if i run more than six or seven miles i get horrible pain in my that's left way, ankle that's way too many miles why are you running that many miles that's the problem i mean that's like only a third of a marathon yeah, not even boring or, yeah not even that's boring it is boring that's true that's why marathon isn't on my that's impossible boring. list i just don't want to do it <laughs> well yeah what would be worse like two hours of meditation or two hours of the marathon I've already uh, meditated for, for like 45 minutes once. I think I could do that way easier than a marathon. Oh, I would be like Ron Swanson in that episode where Chris takes him to meditate. And he, and he ironically did an incredibly there. good job. <laughs> yeah, but he hated it. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll, if you if you ever want me to do that, you can you can entice me with like a Greek restaurant afterwards. Potentially. All right. What did you learn from this book? Good, sir. Well, some things, some stuff. Uh, I learned some interesting uh, study results. That's the primary okay. thing I want to say I learned. For the most part, there were things that I had read in other locations. I've read a thousand productivity books at this point. A lot of it's just refreshing stuff or coming at it from mm-hmm. a different angle. So the biggest thing I learned was the results of several studies. The first of which is incredible to me because... They had some people that wanted to actually study how often people switch between tasks. And mm-hmm. they got this company to allow them to put a logging program on their users' computers so that it would, statistically, it would give them how often do they switch programs? How often do they get distracted by email? Doing stuff like that. And it seemed like the result was that an average was to switch tasks every 40 seconds. And when they had apps like instant messaging or Skype open, it was every 35 seconds. Now, I knew people were bad at focus, but if you had asked me how long I thought people can focus before they get distracted, 
even I don't think I would have said 40 seconds. That's pathetic. That yeah. is that is absurdly low. I can't even comprehend how it's seeing the numbers out there really makes it clear that it's a real problem because I would have at mm-hmm. least gone five or 10 minutes. So when I read that study, because I think in terms of statistics, I'm like, all right, that's an average number. So there are clearly people who are able to focus for longer than that. And it's computer work. Who are the people? So they've got a bunch going on. The other, like, who are the people who are on the other side of that? Who the very lowest that are just constantly. Yeah, it's just for the average to be that low, and assuming some of them focus longer because they're doing their job. That's yeah. That's not looking good. There, there were so many study results in this book, and the overall picture they paint. I have to wonder, like, how accurate could it co- could it possibly be? And I, I think a lot of it is like it's a lot of different studies that he brings in, and all these studies, you know, aren't part of one overall study. There are yeah, multiple yeah. different academic teams, but there, yeah, there was one that was like it takes on average twenty two minutes to resume a task after you have like an external distraction. Uh, and he said for internal distractions where you distract yourself, that number goes up to 29 minutes to get back. And like half your day is spent in mind wandering mode. Um, and yeah, there were some, there were some crazy yeah. ones. Like I'm trying I'm looking through my notes and unfortunately my notes are, I think I took too many notes on this book. Uh, yeah. One study found that we switch between computer applications on average 566 times a day, which includes 21 Facebook checks. And that average included people who didn't use Facebook. So if you only take people who use Facebook at least once, it's a 38 check average. People are checking Facebook 38 times a day. Yeah. And then I got a question like, <laughs> when was this specific one done? Because, but, you know, maybe they're, people are probably doing that with whatever social media they enjoy at this mm-hmm. point. But yeah, there was an interesting one that I, I read and I, 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 so I put notes of like my own thoughts in italics. Um, there was one interesting tidbit about sex. So apparently women have fewer interruptions and they distract themselves less, less often. And I was I did interested. See that. I was like, hmm, I wonder why that is. Like why why do you guys seem unable to to focus quite as easily? I don't know. But yeah, there's there's all these different things. There was some stats about how long people spend on email. I'm like, man, if you take all of these together it paints a picture that no one ever gets any work done. (laughs) I don't know that I instinctively think that's wrong. I mean, (laughs) it's an exaggeration to think that that exact sentence is true. But if you think about how many people are working eight hours in an office and you consider how many of those hours were actually necessary for you to do what you did today that was worth doing, I think that we would just become really sad to find out that most people are just being paid to waste their time which mm-hmm. hurts both the company and the person, but we both we have both groups keep doing it because we're like, I don't know, it feels like the right thing to do. I saw a tweet recently that was something along the lines of, you know, a lot of managers these days, like if you if you were very honest about their job description, it is have my online icon be green and slack. Yeah. Like there's so many jobs have yeah, they've just like taken on all these superfluous responsibilities and I think it may be interesting to see, you know, what the landscape looks like after all this quarantining is over and everyone's kind of become used to flatter organizations and remote work and all this stuff. There were some other ones that baffled me. 70% of emails are opened within the first six seconds of receipt. That really? seems insane to me. I am none of like, those. So that's absurd. Our- are people sitting in their offices or in their cubicles or wherever with their email pro- program open all day with no- like notifications on and they just instantly open every email that comes in? Sounds terrible. I get like a hundred emails a day. That'd be like, that's like a hundred interruptions per day if I were to actually be opening them within six seconds of receipt. That, that's crazy. Yeah, and most of them aren't even important. And um, then there was another thing where when they were trying to do their studies, the same group that did the logging program Mm -hmm. took six years to find an organization that would let them study employees when they went without email for a week. It took six six years to find a company that was like emails, not the most crucial thing ever for at least one week. That's most of the email is garbage. Didn't they find that it was much better 
and they kind of kept doing that after the study. I'm not sure why I don't remember that. I think I have it in here. Too many um, studies. Yeah, another one. One study found that knowledge workers spend 37% of their time in meetings. So yeah, here's my conclusion. If all these studies are correct, when when are knowledge workers doing any actual work? 88 email checks per day, 29 minutes to get back on task after an interruption, and 37% of your workday in meetings. Like If all that's true, I feel like most people get their work done in three hours instead of eight. I mean, that kind of just lines up with how much time books like Deep Work posited that we could focus really well on something per day anyway. It was like yeah. three three periods of 90 minutes and you'd probably be mentally tapped out on one thing. Mm-hmm. And it was just a lot of things it's a, after reading so many books, a lot of things seem to point to the fact that we really are only going to get three or four good hours done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have, have noticed the rest that. is just busy work. Mm hmm. So one thing that this book did for me was it sort of served as a reminder that I need to take focus seriously and set things up to enable that. Um, And that's why I think, you know, books like this for me are sometimes helpful, even though I've been writing and making videos about productivity for years at this point. Yeah. And even if I haven't read all the studies that were presented in this book, most of the concepts for me were review rather than a bunch of new stuff. Yeah. Which is a very different to the book that I'm reading right now, which is called range. There's a lot of very new things in that book. I've never heard of before. So it's kind of a different reading experience. This was kind of review Um, for people who haven't spent 10 years plus reading about productivity. I think it's a good overview of focus. Uh, And I kind of want to go through a few of the things that it sort of spurred me to do. Um, And those are going to be kind of be my lessons, I suppose. And the, I think the biggest one was the bit about intentionality because I did find it very easy to sort of slip into a a habit of just sort of working on autopilot or loading my task list up with way too many things. And it's one of those things where like I've said it to myself a zillion times, you have to have only a few things on your task list. And then it's so easy to justify why today, well, I've got more than that to do. So I'm just going to put, you know, five or six on my list and uh, they don't get done. You know, like half the time they just don't get done because things take longer than you think they're going to take. So the bit about setting a deliberate intention when you sit down to work before you sit down to work, actually just being like, this is what I'm going to do during this session. That was very helpful for me to sort of review and, and rebuild into my system. Yeah. Like you don't, Uh, you don't sit down and say, I'm going to start working. You just say, I'm going to, insert actual activity then yeah. cuz working is some vague ambiguous thing mhm yeah and i find if it's if my intention is i'm going to sit down and get to work or if it is if it's too big like i'm going to research this video uh that's a lot so yeah. i'll probably sit down and be like well you know what i'm just going to check my email first that's something concrete and defined which should be a dead giveaway about the crappiness of my intention because my mind is looking for a well-defined task that is easier. Checking my email, there are there are certain aspects of that that you could attribute to distractibility and dopamine hits. You know, an email is, you don't know what's going to, you never know what you're going to get, right? It's like a box of chocolates. Uh, but the other thing is going through my email, clearing my inbox. That is a well-defined task that I know shouldn't take that long. I know that when I accomplish it, when I finish it, I'm going to have a quick little feeling of accomplishment. So it is an attractive task. And what that means is I need to make whatever my intention is, have some of those same qualities. So for like researching a video, I need to break that down. Uh, Research for 25 minutes, you know, typical set the timer thing. And, um, maybe take one of the questions I have in my preliminary notes and go down that rabbit hole or take two articles that I have listed. Cause the way that I typically research is I'll go and I'll just search for the topic, open up a zillion tabs, copy all those URLs and then start that, going through them. Yeah, that is true. That is what you But do. you know, you can't go through every URL 
in one session, or maybe you could, but if you tell yourself, I'm going to do that again, it's overwhelming. And you're once again, finding yourself checking your email. So by being a lot more defined by taking a smaller, uh, I guess like adopting a smaller scope in my attention, I'm going to be a lot more likely to do it. Yeah. So that was helpful for me. Uh, what was a big one for you? I would say that I liked the, I really liked that the second half of the book was about scatter focus, which I believe yeah. we've also referred to as diffused mode before. Yeah. So, so that, that's thing. a term from the uh, Mind for Numbers by Bob yeah. Oakley. She but it calls um, it the focus mode and the diffuse mode. And here Chris calls it hyper focus and scatter focus. Yeah. And I actually kind of prefer scatter focus as a name. I think it makes it more clear mm-hmm. what the point is. Um, but I thought it was really important to bring that up because that's where a lot of the creative thoughts, that's where a lot of problem solving thoughts occur. And basically, I liked the thought that when we're coming up with those things, it's like we're connecting different dots. We're connecting thoughts and experiences. So if we want to be creative or good problem solvers, we need to accumulate a wide breadth of both of those things. We need to add dots. Mm. So it's like becoming a T shaped person where you want to be, you want to have depth in your skill set, but you want to have breadth as well. But also, yeah, even within how you choose to go deeper into a skill set, if I want to become a good artist, if I want to make really good pixel art, I should study different types of art, not just pixel art, so that I can take disparate lessons from various places, combine them, come up with something interesting myself, and solve problems in ways that maybe somebody who had only studied their topic, or if you're writing a book who had only ever read one genre, they wouldn't be able to pull in something interesting from a different genre. Um, yeah. my One of my favorite characters, if not my favorite character from Avatar The Last Airbender, specifically takes inspiration from each other culture and different bending styles. And they are all the wiser for it and much cooler because of it. Mm -hmm. You just, you need to be able to connect things indirectly. And in order to do that, you just have to go out and learn new things, not knowing why they're valuable. Yeah. I was also, um, I, I didn't like the recent survey that he referenced in this section that mentioned 83% of Americans said that they didn't spend any time whatsoever relaxing or thinking in the 24 hour period before they were surveyed. So how are you going to accumulate dots? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're all just stressed out a lot. Uh, All the time, always working, always doing chores, always something. A lot of my best stuff has come from sitting around and thinking and nothing else. This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Hover, which is the best place on the internet to get your hands on a domain name. And if you do not have a domain name for yourself yet, that is something you're going to want to get as quickly as possible. If you do not have a place online where you show off your work, you build a portfolio, and you let people connect with you, then you are passing up potential connections and potential opportunities. And I don't think I have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Anybody can take a domain name, which means if you don't have the domain name for your name right now, anybody out there could go and get it very easily. I learned this the hard way. And I think I want to say that I tried to get my domain name pretty early on in my student career, but it uh, turns out Thomas Frank is a pretty common name. So I was not able to get thomasfrank.com, but I was at least able to get thomasjfrank.com. So no one was able to take that from me. I don't have to have like Thomas Jonathan Frank com or something like that. Yeah. And on that side, I have my portfolio. I show off some of my work. I have a contact form. I have ways for people to connect with me. And when I was a student, I had a more student focused portfolio. Um, and that was able to help me to get internships and secure other really cool opportunities. And if you are ready to get your domain name, which hopefully you are, uh, Hover is the best place to do it. Not only do they have over 400 different domain extensions, including a great one for your portfolio, which is the dot me domain extension. And I found that that domain extension doesn't have quite so many of the names already taken. In fact, I was able to get Thomas Frank dot me today before we got onto this podcast call. Yeah, that's pretty miraculous. I know, right? I felt kind of dumb for have not having not gotten it before today, but I was able to lock that down. So 
I kind of technically now have a Thomas Frank domain. It's not .com, but it's .me, and that's pretty good for a portfolio website. So they have .me. They also have many, many other domain extensions, .pizza, .limo, .ninja, all kinds of really fun ones. I have thomas.lol. That's a pretty cool domain. Not but if really. you're looking to build a portfolio website, .me is a great domain extension along with your uh, more traditional .com. But like we said, it's kind of hard to get a .com these days if it's like a really short or common name. So if you are ready to lock down your domain, you can go over to hover.com slash CIG. And when you go to that specific URL, you're going to get 10% off your first purchase. And then once you have your domain, they have some extra features that you can use to uh, make it even more valuable. There's an email feature. So you can set up a professional email address, such as thomas at collegeinfogeek.com, which is mine. And they also have a connect feature, which allows you to hook your domain up to many different website builders like Squarespace and Shopify. So once again, hover.com slash CIG, and that is H-O-V-E-R.com slash CIG to get 10% off your first order and to support the show. Thanks as always to Hover for supporting our show as well as the sponsor. And let's get back into it. Yeah, the, the whole idea that you want to collect a wide range of dots, both so you can enhance the current skills and knowledge bases that you have, but also expose yourself to new ones. I really resonated with that. Um, right now, I'm actually reading an entire book about that concept. It's called Range. And I definitely want to discuss that book on the podcast with you. I'm about halfway through the book and I would already recommend it to anybody. Uh, we call it cool. an essential read. And there's a there's a lot of interesting stuff in there that sort of debunks the idea that you have to start super early to get good at something. Like a lot of people think, you know, if you haven't started piano or violin or chess or whatever it is super early, then you'll never mm. be great at it. You hear that a lot and with language. There's a lot of really interesting research showing that the elite performers more often than not are not the ones who started when they were two years old. In most disciplines, they kind of try out a bunch of things. And if it's say athletics, trying out a bunch of sports gives them this base of athleticism that's very general and very adaptable, which they then use to get super good at whatever they eventually pick. And then their practice hours go up. Or for musicians, a lot of great musicians played multiple instruments throughout their entire lives or early on. And then their experience in multiple instruments lends itself towards quicker progression in the one they eventually commit in. So this whole idea of, of just collecting this wide array of dots, I really liked. Um, and I loved this idea that he had. And I think you mentioned that you wanted to talk about this too, but um, he talks about like in terms of choosing what dots you want to consume, making them bid for your attention, even while you're consuming them. Yeah. I liked that a lot because we often feel like, oh, if I started a show, I, I have to finish it. If I started a book, I have to finish it. And it, it's not always valuable all the way through. No, so it does, it does feel you... like you've got to finish it. It feels, I yeah. mean, obviously the sunk cost fallacy is at play here, but it's really powerful. And it feels, what if I don't finish like uh, this random book or, or project or something? There might be something right at the 90% mark that I really need and I just don't know it yet. But <laughs> thus far I haven't benefited much, but still, yeah. In this next fish is going to be the big one. It's kind of like keeping junk around your house just in case you might need it. Yeah. Like my house came with this TV stand thing that bolts into the wall, like a wall mounted TV stand. And I'm like, well, well maybe someday I'll want to bolt a TV to the wall. So maybe I should keep it like, yeah, I haven't done it yet. Why keep junk around? And the yeah. same thing is like, yeah, if, if, if something is not benefiting you, why keep it around? I had this realization with the anime One Piece. Back when we were all living together in college, I was watching One Piece and I got 200 episodes in. Yeah. And I realized, you know what? A lot of these episodes are really padded out. There's very little substance in between a lot of the filler well, yeah, like especially because you're watching the show, which directly has a bunch of filler that isn't even in the manga, which is already long yeah. enough. Yeah. So I dropped it. And, you know, it's like this. This is fine. But I think I could spend my attention on better things. And I've quit books, too. Yeah, you know, I think with especially with like nonfiction books, we sort of feel this pressure to keep going because I don't know. We're going to feel like quitters. If yeah. We stop reading a book. And 
it almost feels like books have this sort of sacred status in terms of mediums for the transfer of knowledge where you're, you're supposed to finish a book because that's like the ultimate thing, you know, YouTube video, whatever. That's nothing. A blog post is nothing. It's, it's, yeah, it's filler. It feels fluff, more, but, you know, a book is where all real knowledge is. And to be fair, like books are where people tend to go very, very deep on topics, but there's another purpose for books. I was going to put this in my video about uh, how, to, how I take notes from books, but I ended up cutting it because it just kind of made the video too long. Um, but I, I, I pointed out in my original cut of that video that some books are great. They're very information dense. The signal to noise ratio is amazing. But some books, quite honestly, are kind of just like glorified business cards for their author authors. Yeah. You know, um, it, it's quite well known that in the nonfiction space, especially, and especially in spaces like self-help, like business, writing a book is a big career booster in many cases. I've been told that uh, if you want to get like, you know, an agent to represent you uh, in terms of getting like speaking gigs at big companies, having a traditionally published book is almost like your foot in the door in many cases. And if you don't have one, like you kind of need something else. And I kind of, I kind of, look at it this way for better for worse traditional media has a lot of pull in terms of how organizations view people's authority how they view legitimacy and for that reason getting a traditionally published book sort of acts like a foot in the door in many cases so that can be a big motivation for writing a book instead of just creating a blog post about a very simple idea um, I've also been told that publishers will sometimes push for books to be of a certain length and that just sort of, you can feel it when that seems to have been the case when you're reading it. Yeah. You're just like, oh, that's cool. I see that you've made your, what's the rest of this? <laughs> exactly. I don't, I don't yeah, get it. And that sort of speaks to, um, our, the way we perceive value in physical objects. Cause when you go to the bookstore and you pick up a book, like, if it's a little hefty, if it's like 200 plus pages, you're like, oh yeah, this is like a you know substantial book. I bet it's chock full of insights. It's going to be good. And if it's this little thin thing, it feels like a stocking stuffer book, even though it might be more valuable because maybe it's communicating the same ideas in half the time, half the space. Yeah. And I don't remember if this is a specific quote or just some old adage or something, but the, the idea that if you can't explain something using simple words in a way that even a kid could understand, you don't really understand it all the way. That implies mm. that short, simple explanations just speak more highly of the person who explained it. And yeah. we're just like, but what if you made that 700 pages longer and used words that I needed a dictionary for? Then would you look <laughs> smart? Consider that. Did you ever get a thesaurus out and change words in book reports and papers back in like middle school to make yourself sound smarter? I don't think so, but I did need to because I excitedly received a set of encyclopedias for my birthday. So I kind of already uh, just knew all those words because I voluntarily read the encyclopedia mm -hmm. because I'm fun. I'm great at parties. I don't think we had a set. I do remember growing up, my dad saying when he was a kid, he would often just pull an encyclopedia volume off the shelf, turn to a random page and, and read whatever he found there and that it would be a great habit to be in. So you could sort of build this wide array of knowledge, but I don't think we actually ever got a set of encyclopedias. They're expensive. Oh yeah. The They're weirdly expensive. Uh, now you don't have to worry about that, I guess, but it was a great mm. gift. I, I was a weird kid, I guess. I do remember doing that at school though, because school had, I think two different sets of the world book and I would just pull a shelf or pull a volume off the shelf sometimes and just read through it, which is fun. And then I remember our friend, Aaron, his browser homepage was just the Wikipedia random URL. Oh, that's pretty So cool. whenever he'd open his browser for the day, it would just pull up a random article. And if he was interested, he would read it. 
just it's kind a good of idea. interesting thing to do it. Maybe he still does it. You could do the know. same thing with like a word of the day sort of thing, except for that's like a topic of the day. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I feel like if I'm just exposed to a word without having a reason to use it, I'm not going to remember it. I would have to find it really interesting. I mean, a lot of fancy words, I I just intentionally let fade away. I'm like, yeah, that's a, I'm never going to use that. And if yeah. I did use it, people would, they would hate me for it. They would be like, what are you saying that for? <laughs> Do you think you're so smart over there? What is this? It's yeah, got to ride least... the line between intellectual and comprehensible so that it doesn't sound like I'm just full of myself if I go use it in a conversation. Well, we all know the best use for really, really complex words is just um, very pretentious song titles in progressive metal albums. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> it needs to mean borderline nothing or it's not artistic enough. In fact, I never really thought about this before, but I, I think I think a lot of very technical metal bands have a little bit of r slash i am very smart in them uh because i definitely see a correlation between highly technical metal music and jargon words in their music or or in their song titles i think i would say uh i think protest the hero does a lot of this i did like the portmanteaus in that norma jean album their second album is, is just nothing but portmanteaus which is pretty great hmm yeah, you don't see a whole lot of just like, I don't know, four on the floor punk bands naming their songs like Skrillex. Yeah, or weird terms I've never heard of. I think it's interesting <laughs> that I'm sure that I had tried to use words that were too weird and smart for certain certain things in life. But I think it's interesting that as I get older, the more I'm just like, I shouldn't be using those words at all, basically, yeah. other than for weird poetic <laughs> purposes they're basically just pretentious. And then even if I have something good to say, no one will want to hear it. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the scatter focus styles? So we had like, he, he kind of like broke down scatter focus, which again, to get people a high level, o high level overview is just the process of essentially letting your mind wander deliberately. Um, there have been many ways this has been talked about. I think in deep work, when Cal Newport talks about active meditation, where he just goes for a walk and kind of mulls over a problem, this is sort of a form of that. Uh, but he, he broke down scatter focus into three different styles, which he called capture mode, problem country mode, and habitual mode. So yeah. capture mode was just like, let your mind wander and then write down what comes to mind. Uh, problem crunching mode was just like holding a problem in your mind and letting your wan mind wander around it. And then habitual mode was like, do something habit based, like go for a walk, go skating. I don't know, juggle chainsaws, something that doesn't take up all of your habit or your attentional space while also yeah. mulling over a problem. I don't know. I, I felt like maybe habitual and, and problem crunching mode were quite similar. I would say I've used, I've done problem solving while like rollerblading i i do those two at the same time for the most part uh, i think it's yeah. interesting to separate them but for me they're usually together i mean in college when i was writing i'd be writing lyrics to music and the almost the only time that i could do it well was just rollerblading at 2 a.m around the campus and around town mm -hmm. and just i needed nothing going on mentally so that I could just kind of capture things and ride in circles and, and do such. It's the best way for me to solve almost anything. Yeah. Same things happened with programming problems. Same things happened with almost anything intense that I need to think about. That's the best way is mm -hmm. to try to disconnect and do something else and just let the answer come to me. I get a lot of ideas when I'm reading. Like I definitely get ideas when I'm out skating Though I, I would say I spend most of my skating time like with people right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I get a ton of ideas of just like reading a book and then something will come to me and I'll end up writing six or seven pages in my distraction journal, which is kind of a distraction journal at this point, but has just become like an idea journal. Yeah, I mean I guess stuff comes to me when I'm when I'm doing other things, but it seems like that's when most of it comes to me. Yeah. I don't know. It was interesting. Uh, I have to say, I don't, I don't do the capture mode where I just sit there with a piece of paper and do nothing. Have you ever done that? 
I don't think that I have done that. I would mm. definitely go try to do some habitual. I, I would absolutely go on a walk or something rather than just sit still and wait for thoughts. Yeah. And when I, the only time I sit still is when I'm like meditating. And for that, I'm not trying to come up with ideas. So it mm-hmm. doesn't really line up with what I'd be doing that for. Do you find that you get ideas anyway when you meditate? You know, sometimes, but it depends. It depends. It's a pretty hit or miss because the goal isn't that. So it's just if an idea decides to show up since I'm yeah. more or less trying not to think. Well, it'd be interesting to know because like you said, you're, you're not intending to have ideas. So I wonder what the frequency of getting ideas anyway is. Yeah, it'd be interesting to pay attention to going forward. Mm -hmm. And I also bet there'd be a difference depending on how long I meditated. Like there's probably a certain level past which I'd be more likely to have ideas pop into my head. Mm -hmm. Rather than like if you do some headspace three minute beginner meditation, I highly doubt you're going to come up with much in three minutes, you know. But if you meditate for a long time, then I could see there being a point past which you just kind of naturally tap into random thoughts Mm -hmm. and headspace is typically guided anyway isn't it i think so so you're kind of still focusing on something i used it once because i heard you could do it in french but i don't typically like guided meditation Mm -hmm. well i don't like any kind of meditation so i will defer to you on you know ultimate Uh, preferences i will go meditate for six hours after this recording i will let you know on a cliff side, yeah, peaceful willow tree in the background or something. Yeah, obviously. And then as the the piece of the cliff that I'm on crumbles down, I will continue meditating as it falls, and only at the last second will I reach out, eyes closed, and grab hold of a branch, and then gently step to the ground. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, how it works. I'm going to do that right after this. You get I just to break find the a laws of physics as long as, as you as long as you were calm enough. The panicking is what kills you. You know, it's certainly not gravity. True. Yeah, your actual weight is correlated to how much you panic when you're falling off of a cliff. Yeah, that's how it works. If you're super calm, you basically, you're as light as a feather. I'm pretty sure I could do this. And we're in Colorado, so there's probably a cliff somewhere out there. That's true. That is true. Actually, um, in, in the Denver metro area, I didn't realize this until like the other day, there's this area where the foothills sort of like part and there's a whole neighborhood that's just back in this little pocket of the foothills. It looks gorgeous. I want to go see it. Hmm. I'm unaware. I really, I I don't know what's there. I think it's just houses, but I want to go see what it looks like in it because it seems like it might look like living in a little valley. Yeah. I don't think I know where this is. I mean, obviously I could probably guess it's clearly in the foothills, but I'm not familiar. Yeah, it's like way on the southwest side of town. Hmm. So I think it would technically be Littleton. I'm not sure though. Um, another really big thing that I took from this book, maybe the biggest, was the creation of a distraction-free ritual. So he kind of talks about how it's important to set up a sequence of steps that um, essentially allows you to uh, get into the mode of focus and takes care of any problems that might arise. So that might mean putting on a distraction blocker. It might mean setting a timer. It might mean letting your family know that you are going to be working for a little while. Please don't interrupt me. Essentially, it is the process of anticipating what may derail you and getting out in front of it and taking care of it before it actually does derail you. Um, This is another thing where it's like, I know I should do this, but... Having somebody tell me once again, in plain terms, yes, you need to do this if you want to focus correctly, spurred me to do it again. Yeah. It feels like a lot of those lessons need to be relearned over and over and over because we can only, like we can do it well for a little bit and mm -hmm. then we'll forget and we'll get caught up into some sort of weakness. Yeah. And then- Yeah, I think being human, I think being human is a process of kind of like- seeing yourself succeed, getting a little bit of hubris, believing you don't need the controls and the discipline and the commitment devices that you needed in the past 
And maybe you don't, but in many cases you do. And you eventually have to be humbled and realize, oh, I need to bring those back in my life. Uh, well, humans like are bad at those kind cycle. of lessons. It's like, so seatbelt laws have likely saved many lives. And it would be ridiculous for us to say, yeah, but see all the lives are safe now. We don't need those seatbelt mm. laws. And then we just get rid of them. What do you think would happen? More people would die. It, yeah. We're just, we're bad at learning that we still need to control things once the control starts doing well for us. Yeah, exactly. It's, I don't, I don't know why that seems such an obvious lesson when you, when you think about it intentionally, but the way we live our lives, we seem to just let it slip through our fingers every time. Yeah. My friend, Sam, who runs this channel called Wonderful Productions, uh, he had a recent video just called like the five rules of risk. And he was talking about how humans perceive things they don't understand as riskier than things they do, even if the statistics say otherwise. So we will see things like skydiving, flying in a plane, all that kind of stuff as riskier than driving because driving is just something that we all do. We kind of know what the experience is like. And to be clear, our, our perception of risk isn't tied to what we know about how risky it is. It's just how familiar we are with the thing itself. Yeah. So like we're all very familiar with driving. And if you look at stats, we know that it is super dangerous, but we do it every day. It's super familiar. So we see it as not risky. And so we get lax and we'll do things like not wearing seatbelts or texting while driving or whatever it is. Yeah. Just cause we're, you know? we're used to it. It seems comfortable. And then mm -hmm. planes will seem scary. Although in my defense, I find planes scarier because on the off chance I do die on a plane, I will get the horrifying suspense Whereas in a car, I have the hope that it's instant, you know? Hmm. Huh? It's, yeah. The risk of being scared is higher for me. So watch that out is for that. True. You do but, have higher but risk I know being scared. statistically, I'm way safer every time. Much lower chance of actually being in that position where you would be scared, though. Now, if you drive off a cliff, you lose both times. So that's true. You'll be scared for a brief moment. Whoops. My, my dad drove his motorcycle off a cliff once. What? Yeah, like what? Your when dad's was, alive. How does that he even was, make when sense? When he was much younger, uh, he was riding. I don't understand what cliffs are. I think. I think my uncle took him out motorcycle riding, but he, my uncle was much more skilled and was, I guess, being a bit of a jerk and pulling ahead and sort of pressuring my dad to go faster. And they were, you know, riding motorcycles up in Yosemite like you do. And uh, yeah, then somehow he drove off a cliff, and this gigantic bush caught him. Apparently. Not the same area, but apparently this also happened to my grandpa once where a bush caught him on his motor. So I'm just not going to buy a motorcycle because apparently. Yeah, but you wanted family. to at, at least one time, Tom. That's true, but I it's, don't. I haven't. I done think it. it's in your blood to want to do something that seems really obviously reckless. It's the old family curse. So it's the, yeah, it's, it's a family curse, clearly. Any Frank man, the eldest Frank man, will get a motorcycle, drive it off a cliff. And be caught by a bush miraculously. Yeah, eventually. It happens to all of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the only reason I brought up the plane thing, not to be like weirdly dark, it's just because I was terrified of planes until yeah. I read a book explaining how they worked. Mm -hmm. And once I understood more of the physics behind why a plane worked and became comfortable with it, similar to how I'm like, well, I know how my car works, it became less scary. It was only when yeah. it was like, well, it's magically in the sky. I don't understand what it's doing. Then it's terrifying. Yeah because it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But now, and, I mean, I still don't like them, but obviously I'm a lot more comfortable with it because I learned how planes work rather than yeah. just being being told statistics yeah, since learning, you can't feel statistics. No, you can't. But yeah, learning how something works definitely helps to bring the fear out of it. And luckily for you, um, you don't have to do anything yourself to ensure that the plane is a safe piece of equipment. Other yeah, I just than, need to maintain my own calm for a few hours. Yeah, just be calm. Like there are other people there who are checking and maintaining the plane and flying it and being well trained. Yeah. You know, but in our own habits, like having a distraction free ritual, it's up to us to maintain them and it can be very easy to get lax and just let them go. You know. Yeah, you can't the, just the, automatically let it happen when you're focusing. Yeah. Luckily, the consequences here are not as bad as texting and driving or driving without a seatbelt. But when you get lax, then you start to be less productive. You spend a lot more time not working intentionally or getting interrupted. 
So I read this and I buckled down and I created a distraction free ritual for myself. So when I want to write, I set an intention, which is smaller than it's often smaller than what's on my whiteboard. So my whiteboard might say like research for this video, but if I'm sitting down for a work session, I'll say, you know, let's research these two articles. Yeah. And if I go further, I go further. But again, it's about having something small enough that I don't feel resistant to starting it. And then I will start a distraction blocking session with freedom, which just blocks, you know, your typical old haunts, your, uh, your old suspects, your Facebooks, Twitter and all that. But for me also any kind of analytics, any kind of email program, anything where my brain will say that's work, go do that real quick. Yeah. Cause it'll feel good to accomplish something. I got to block that. I'll set a timer. And right now I'm using a little app up in my, uh, Mac toolbar just called be focused. I was using, um, tide, which is like a timer app on your phone, but I also keep my phone away from me on the other side of the office and I have it on do not disturb for like most of the day. Oh, so, so you can't, I use like, the, you don't want to use the phone timer. Yeah. I like tide, but I don't really want my phone even on my desk. Cause you gotta buy an iPod touch. Well, I could do that. I don't want to do that. No. Why would I buy an iPod just for a timer? <laughs> well, it's a terrible idea, but didn't it sound good at for a second? Cause you were like, wouldn't it be productive to go to the store and buy something new? Oh yeah. Don't, don't you, don't you put that idea in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more fun than working. I think the first time I bought an Apple watch, it was partly that as a justification. It's like, oh, I'm going to be so productive with this Apple watch. It probably has Pomodoro apps. I'm going to, yeah, going to the store and consuming product is productive right now. Yeah. It's very easy to sell yourself on something like that. Yeah, that and yet being I've said, had the same laptop for seven years, so clearly we don't need to buy all the gadgets. No, we don't. I, I do like my Watch Series 5, though. Uh, that, is specifically the activity rings and the fact that I share my ring data with Dave, my friend, and um, I have the notifications on for how many streak days in a row I've been active. So I make sure that I do all my three rings every day. And I wasn't able to get them for most of the day yesterday because my mom's in town and it was just a very busy day. But uh, I was like, all right, I have to get it. So I rollerbladed at like 11 p.m. <laughs> and did like three or four miles just to get the ring. Nice. Have to get it. Yeah. So for me, it's like accountability. And then I love that I can have my voice recording note thing as a just a shortcut button on the home screen. Because oh. I got a lot of song ideas. And That's kind riff of cool. ideas and stuff like that. So I like to be able to just instantly record. But yeah, for the most part, you know, going to the Apple store to buy something is not productive. I'm pretty sure I bought that when I was like, it was a weekend. So it wasn't like, I'm going to drive to the store during a work day because this is justified. No, it's not. It's a weekend yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, any long story short, I'm using Be Focused, which I think there's a free version. Yeah, there is a free version and then you can remove... I don't even know what it is like a little thing in the modal that advertises the premium version. I guess you could get to remove that if you pay for it. I, I don't know what else it gives you. <laughs> um, <laughs> premium version. We won't keep telling you about the premium version. That That's may have it. been what it, I think there's extra stuff that I don't care about, like tracking the number of sessions you do. Per ah, day. Okay. I don't care about that. I don't, I honestly don't track my time and I don't track how many sessions I've done because I find that to be tedious and it is not really in service of the goal, which is again, to just get me past the resistance and to hold me accountable while I'm working. Yeah. Every time I've tried time tracking and I legit keep the statistics, eventually it becomes more about the, the statistics and the numbers than the work. And I'm just, this is counterintuitive at some point mm -hmm. for me just distracts me. And I'm like, what do I categorize this under? Now I have to figure out what category all the weird things I do for work fall under. And that's like 10 categories. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I guess the last kind of part of that uh, ritual is if I think about it, letting Anna know that I would like to be not disturbed unless she really needs me during the next half hour or so. Yeah. Ashley and I have been working on something similar. Um, mm -hmm. Change the light next to me to some color. Okay. Uh, and you're, you're still working out in the living room, aren't you? I'm working in the living room. Yeah. So it's really, 
it is kind of impressive to me how much I can't work if people are around me in the slightest. I was working on an article. I was doing really well. Ashley comes downstairs, doesn't even talk to me. Just go get something from the kitchen. Immediately, my mind clears and I'm subconsciously prepared to talk, even if there was never any indication. Mm -hmm. And I knew she wasn't going to because she had said earlier she wouldn't talk to me. It doesn't matter. I can't be around people. So I yeah. have to have a distraction free mode where I know that I'm completely alone or like nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I have noticed something kind of similar where I face the wall. So I can't really see if Anna's moving about behind me outside the mm. office, but I can feel it because of the footsteps. Yeah. So if I, and I have noise canceling headphones, so I don't hear it, but I feel the footstep thuds. And then I'm like, Oh, is she going to come in here? Is she going to talk to me? So yeah, it gets yeah, a little bit that difficult. That anticipation is super hard for me to deal with. It's like the biggest. Yeah. But if I've communicated, I'm like, hey, can I have the next 35 minutes? Just don't interrupt me. Or if you need to do something like text me or send me a Slack message, I'll see it after uh, my session. You know, if, if you need me, come get me. Then she's less likely to interrupt me when I'm trying to work. But more importantly, I've sort of taken care of that anxiety. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you would actually do that, but that might be helpful. We've started to, it, mm -hmm. and it's worked a lot better. Yeah. But yeah, so those are kind of my three lessons, deliberately setting intentions, um, the importance of scatter focus, specifically making the things you consume sort of bid for your attention, even during the act of consumption, uh, and then the distraction-free ritual. Those are kind of the things that I took from it. Um, yeah, and I think... Yours were fairly similar. Yeah, I mean, mine were just being surprised at the 40-second distraction <laughs> yeah. thing. Uh, appreciating the scatter focus, putting it putting it in terms of like connecting dots, I think is a really good way to explain that because mm -hmm. I've tried to talk about it before to people, but I think this is, this is a way easier way to say, well, you want to connect dots, and right now you have like no dots. Yeah. There aren't a lot of connections you can make even if you tried. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, then the, the getting things to bid for your attention was was a big one for me too. Just I really liked the the part where it was like notice when you don't have time for something because yeah. you always have time, you're just spending it on something else and et cetera. And like I know that, but I forget it. And then I find myself complaining that I don't have time for things and not really questioning where that time is going. Mm -hmm. And I just give it to whatever has claimed it deserves my time. And there have been a few nonfiction books, including um a part of the last part of this book where I've like skimmed through it quickly, still paying yeah. attention, but usually I will cling to every single word. Like every single word must have value. Mm -hmm. And I slow myself down a bunch that way. So I really like this remembering that I don't need to hold on to everything once I've yeah. gotten the value I needed from it. I think uh, going forward, I do want to figure out a way to still take notes, but take viewer notes because I took so many notes in this book. Like every fact, every little study thing, I just, I was like, I need to record that. And I, I think I need to record a little bit less in the future. One thing I wanted to bring up before we end here uh, is what I think is important when you're reading a book. If something confuses you, don't let that confusion go. So there was one study result that he cited near the end of the book when he's talking about like working around your energy levels. Um, he cited this study that said, uh, you know, people are uh, least engaged on Mondays and most engaged on Fridays, which I was like, people are most engaged in their work on Fridays. I mean, I guess if you're trying to get out of there as quick as possible, that could make sense. Like you certainly that just, have less dread. I, I, yeah, I mean, whenever when I had a my full time job at the internship, Fridays were like senioritis day. I didn't feel engaged. Now I feel very engaged on Fridays right now because I have B minor going and videos are going up on the weekend. So it's like yeah. Fridays are usually a pretty intense day. But I, when I don't have super crazy deadlines, I found that Fridays are like the worst day of the week. So. I'm like, I'm curious about this study result. And I go into the notes section. I find the paper that he cited. It's called Bored Mondays and Focused Afternoons, The Rhythm of Attention and Online Activity in the Workplace. Um, and the summary, because I, I didn't have access to the full paper, 
but it said on Mondays, people are most bored, but also most focused. Which I think kind of changes the meaning. Because the way he hmm. had said it was just like, people are just, they're least engaged, most bored on Mondays. But the study says they're bored, but they're also the most focused on Mondays. So Okay, so they're getting their work done, but they hate it. Yeah, so I feel like the way that study was cited in the book was a little bit misinterpreted. Um, and that was just sort of a reminder for me to not always just straight up agree with everything that you read in a book, even if there is a scientific study being cited there, because, and you know, in some cases the site, the way that the study is cited could be inaccurate or sometimes the study itself could be flawed. But what if and, you like the results and they support <laughs> something that you already claim to be true? Well, in that case, just, you know, accept it. Silent scene. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I do fine. that all the time. <laughs> I've never been wrong so far. Yeah. Um, there's a, a quote from Aristotle, maybe, because I never know if quote citations are real, but uh, it was something along the lines of it. It's the mark of an intelligent mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Yeah. And I like that quote. Like, we don't need to just sight unseen accept all facts when they are presented to us because they may not indeed be facts so yeah notice confusion yeah and i think that's probably where we can end this unless you have anything else you want to add no i think i think after this i'm going to take take a good break from straight up productivity books i'm really interested in a lot of other ones yeah well the one i'm reading right now which i would like to discuss on the podcast is called range that one sounds uh, interesting. It's not really a productivity book. Kind of has to do with human performance and learning, but it's, I find it very fascinating. Hmm. So uh, I'm going to put that out there as potential homework for people. If you want to have read the book before we discuss it, I think the next one we'll discuss will be range. I don't yeah. know when it's going to be. I don't make promises on books. Yeah. Because I would be dedicating you to reading a book as well. So it will be at some point. So I think that's probably where we're going to end this episode. Um, as always, you can find the show notes over at CIGpodcast.com slash 296 because this is episode 296. Or you can go over to CIGpodcast.com and find ways to subscribe to the show if you haven't done so already. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and the ethereal clouds in space that uh, you see if you look up into the sky in a non-populated place. If you interpret the patterns in a certain way, you will understand that uh, the podcast is all around you. It was inside you the entire time. All right. Just That's like cool. the power to vanquish evil. <laughs> Thanks as always for listening. If you want to support the show, share it with a friend, let them know what your favorite episode is, or maybe give us a rating and review over on Apple podcasts, which as far as I'm concerned is the only, or as far as I know is the only platform that has ratings and reviews. So that is a place where you can where you can leave those. Spotify doesn't have that. I guess you can subscribe on Spotify. That review us on Yelp. Us. There we go. Yeah, review review the podcast uh, on Yelp. I don't I don't <laughs> know how Yelp works. Maybe you could squeeze us in there in some category. Okay, we'll do that. Write us a Yelp review. Write us a TripAdvisor review. <laughs> I've gone on a journey with the College of Geek podcast. Four to five stars. <laughs> the snacks work very good. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, and we will see you in the next episode. Stay cute.